Hi, I'm Professor Francois Fenter. I'm a HIV clinician working in central Johannesburg in South Africa, attached to universities, the University of the Witwatersrand. Um, my talk is going to be around adherence considerations in antiretroviral um, regimens. Specifically, I, I think I want to emphasize right through the talk is that this is probably the most difficult thing about being a clinician and separates good clinicians from okay clinicians is getting into the heads of patients and getting them to swallow tablets for the rest of their life. And that really is a challenge and it's not easy and it's often not as simple as a drug side effect or putting your finger on a, on a simple sound bite. And it can be a long process that extends sometimes over years and even decades in terms of you looking after your patients. I am part of a consortium of clinicians and activists and public health experts and researchers trying to make treatment safer and easier and cheaper across the globe. And I work with these people to look at these things to try and address things and make adherence that much easier. So this treatment is magical. And often I found um, when you have people skeptical about how good antiretrovirals are, I just show them these photographs, but often I've treated their family members, their domestic workers, their people working for them. And this convinces them when they take, you take people who are very sick and you turn them back into fully functional human beings. And part of what the challenge we're dealing is we've been so good at this that we have taken life expectancy with HIV treatment and made it almost normal. As long as your CE4 count when you start is good, you're pretty much going to live a normal life expectancy. In fact, there's some studies showing that people are living longer than the general population. So the takeaway message I take from this is this is the long haul. We are not talking about saving people in the hospital services. We're not talking about getting them onto antiretrovirals and making them feel better. We are talking about 10, 20, 40, 50 years of treatment where people are going to be taking this therapy. And that is a very different challenge from what many of us who grew up with HIV had to deal with, which was saving lives and you know, being miracle workers and resurrecting dying people. Now we're talking about the much more boring, but actually much more challenging work, which is this long haul. One of the things that has made our lives easier is that we've actually made sex safe. Now, I know for many clinicians, this is a little bit uncomfortable because you know, we don't know how to talk to patients about this and it's the public health messaging about it. But the reality of it is once your viral load is undetectable, you will not transmit HIV. And we have really good articles um, published in The Lancet, which demonstrate that that undetectability means almost no, trans in fact, no transmissions. Even if you're HIV negative, if you take pre-exposure prophylaxis, if you're going into high-risk situation, we've, um, we've used this in our sex worker population here in central Johannesburg, or if you're exposed um, either to unsafe sex or to a needle stick and you need post-exposure prophylaxis, these drugs work like a bomb. Um, so antiretrovirals have actually made sex safe. They mean that if you're positive, you won't transmit, and if you're negative, you won't get it, as long as you, again, you swallow the tablets. And it's led to a huge focus, particularly in Western countries around the U equals U, that undetectable equals untransmissible, and that almost acknowledging that you can make somebody essentially therapeutic but with, with antiretrovirals HIV negative. Again, I think many of my clinician friends are a little bit uncomfortable with this messaging, but the reality of it is once your viral load goes below a thousand copies, it appears you do not transmit the virus. One of the things that we see, and this is just data from South Africa, which demonstrates that people coming in with a low CD4 count, these late presenters are either testing late or they're testing early and they're just not coming forward for services, is very, very stable. So in South Africa and across the globe, in fact, it doesn't matter whether you're in London, whether you're in Delhi or in the, you're in Adelaide, it's the C4 count threshold of these late present, uh, the percentage of people coming in with a low uh, C4 count, whether you use that threshold as 200 or 100, actually is pretty steady. So there's a group of patients who, for, I think for psychological reasons, are just in denial, who are still declaring themselves very late. And this group of patients are amongst the most difficult patients to, uh, to flag for adherence. So one of the cheap and easy tests for clinicians is if somebody came in with a very low C4 count when you started them, those are the ones who really need you to be paying attention to the adherence messaging and some of the stuff I'm going to be talking around at the moment. And we see with surrogates such as cryptococcal meningitis, the same thing. So just to talk about the history of HIV, in the dark old ages, we had nothing. We had no antiretroviral therapy. Then we got one tablet in the case of AZT in the kind of late 80s. And then slowly we've been adding more and more tablets. And then we started fusing those tablets into two tablets and into one tablet. 
And then we started to play with drugs that were safer and safer and safer. And at the moment, throughout the globe, we're sitting with one tablet once a day. Um, and these tablets have become safer and safer and cheaper and cheaper. And at the moment, for most of the globe, we're in the integrated era. We're using either dolutegravir in most of our countries or bictegravir or other integrated inhibitors um, have kind of taken over from efavirenz, which was the, the overwhelming favorite four or five years ago. And these drugs are incredibly well tolerated. The side effect profile is laughable compared to what we had in the late say, 80s and early 90s. But we continue looking for them, and we'll be talking about some of these side effects in just a moment. But what we're seeing now is the rise of the injectables, drugs that you can give every two or three months into your muscles, and then as well as into the implantables, uh, drugs that we can actually put under your arm, very similar to contraception that might last for a year. So the, the treatment paradigm is steadily changing to be easier and easier, and it's looking more and more like contraception. You've got tablets, you can have injections, you can have implants. Um, the same level of, of tailoring different interventions to patients. We're also seeing the rise of less and less oral tablets, like you know, the single patient formulations. Rather than having three drugs, we've now got two. And there's several dual therapy studies that um, have been completed in the last little while. Um, we've seen the rise of a new class of drugs. Um, the first in class is a new drug called Dislatrevir. Very powerful drugs. They are so powerful that that old paradigm of only being able to get viral suppression with three drugs is being overturned and we're getting away with, with two drugs. And powerfully is the two drug combinations include the injectables, the first classes of the injectables that you can see there at the bottom, these combinations of oral perverine and cabotegravir. So it's an amazing time to be alive with HIV as well as to be a treating clinician because we're improving and improving. We're getting less drugs, more powerful drugs, safer drugs all the time. And essentially, as I said, because it's no longer transmissible, HIV is very similar to diabetes and, and, and hypertension. It's useful to be thinking about that in terms of the adherence messaging. So if you take your treatment well, it's a non-communicable disease. And this is where the challenge is, get the if. Um, and that's, as I said, where the challenge and the differentiation between a good and a bad clinician starts to, uh, starts to become. So this is what a life expectancy table I took away from. This is for HIV negative communities is that, as our cultures and our societies and our health systems have improved, we have not eradicated infectious diseases. Anyone who lives now in a time of COVID can roll the eyes, obviously, but we've taken away a lot of infectious diseases. So TB, pneumonia, influenza are no longer killing people like they did um, even as long in a place like the United Kingdom or in Europe and America, rich countries. Um, Infectious diseases are not, you know, we're killing people in the 1940s and 1950s and very quickly were obliterated. Then we had a wave of mortality associated with chronic disease, diabetes, hypertension, and with it, heart attacks and strokes and cancers. And now that's starting to move. And what you want is what I like to call the ideal situation, which is you keep yourself completely healthy until suddenly and you have this very brief period where you're unhealthy and you drop dead, preferably of a massive stroke while playing golf and at the age of 93. So that's kind of the perfect life that you keep you as vital and as healthy as possible until the terminal event. And that's what we're doing in HIV now. We're starting, people are no longer dying of TB, of pneumococcus, of cryptococcus. They are dying of, you know, they're starting to die of other things of, in my, certainly my country of obesity related conditions and things. And so what we try to do is to try and find the least number of side effects so that people can get to that point where they, you know, they dropped dead suddenly having lived an amazing and healthy life. So the question of it is why don't people take the medication? It's useful for me to think about in, in different frameworks. It's firstly drug issues. Now, are the drugs inconvenient? So in the old days, we used to take tablets several times every day. We now have the single tablet once a day. Um, but we get to a stage where we can, we, don't, we can even get beyond that. We can give an injection, we can give an implant quite soon that takes away the inconvenience of daily dosing. Some people prefer oral daily dosing, I know I would, but some people just prefer getting an injection every two or three months. Um, dosing schedules, as I said, have got to the stage where we have a single tablet once a day, not multiple tablets multiple times a day. Side effects have gone down and down and down. They're still there and it's important to acknowledge them and I'll come back to it in a moment. But compared to the days of AZT and D4T and indinavir and protease inhibitors, these are just, they are so much lower than they used to be. Um, I put resistance in brackets because in the integrase inhibitor era, 
resistance is almost never a reason for people um, failing their therapy. It's not a reason for them not taking the medicines, but for failing therapy, it's very unusual for people now to fail therapy on integrase inhibitors simply because of resistance. It's not impossible, but it's, it's very unusual. There are also much more conventional things, which are actually harder to solve than drug issues, which are the systems issues. Coming to the clinics on time, um, coming to the clinics and they don't have your drugs, coming to the clinics and having confronted with unfriendly staff. And it's interesting, the issue of empathy, the feeling of relating to a patient's suffering and perceptions of empathy. There have been good studies done in the TB world, which suggest that more so than side effects of drugs, and TB drug side effects are much more significant than antiretroviral side effects. Um, perceiving that your nurse who is looking after you, cares about you and worries about you, is much more um, of a factor in adherence than the drug side effect. So this issue of staff attitudes, of perceptions around how people feel about you, comes up in patient satisfaction um, surveys again and again. And then there's the stuff about the patients themselves. As I said earlier, there's the question of denial. Some people just can't get their heads around having a chronic illness. That, and it's frustrating as healthcare workers because, you know, take your tablet once a day and you'll be back to normal. Um, but for, these are very complex issues and very different from different societies. Certainly in African, South African societies, this idea of pollution of the blood is a very powerful one that people can relate to often. And you know, the idea of being polluted is by the virus itself is, is, is something that people really, really respond to and, and think about a lot. And I've seen in some communities being able to say, look, the drugs clean out your blood. They, you know, the virus has gone from your bloodstream. People respond to that when I start using those in metaphors. And in other countries, I can imagine in Asia, that you can have very different stories to tell in terms of this. The other things which we do very badly is deal with mental health issues. Depression, for instance, is strongly correlated with poor adherence. And unfortunately, screening for mental health issues, for anxiety, depression, the common ones, um, is very, very poor. And the interventions as well are very, very poor. Substance use is a huge issue in my country. Alcohol use is associated with poor outcomes. It's not by itself isn't associated with poor outcomes in HIV, but it is associated with poor adherence. And again, to the root of that, depending on whatever drug is available, it's certainly in central Johannesburg, we're starting to see the rise of heroin use. Um, probing that and trying to support people in terms of their substance use is very important. Understanding that for many patients, substance use is a cyclical thing. It's not um, something that disappears one day and you've solved the problem. It's something you have to return to again and again. And again, for healthcare workers, that can be very, very frustrating, but something needs to happen. And then at the bottom, I just put their life happens. And you know, often my colleagues think about life as a patient as being a seamless thing where you just need to come to a clinic visits and swallow your tablets. People's relationships break down. They lose their jobs. They move province. They change cities. They, you know, they, as I said, the substance use problems get out of control. Life happens and they fall off the adherence bandwagon. And you can be the best doctor. You're the most amazing nurse on the planet. And it doesn't matter how good you are. Some patients are just, life is going to be too chaotic, too difficult for them to continue to be adherent. And you're going to have to pick up the pieces, try and get them back on the wagon, try and get them taking their tablets again. And again, that's for me what differentiates good clinicians from so-so clinicians is being able to understand that your role is sometimes just to pick up the pieces, that it's not your fault, or even sometimes the patient's fault that things happen, that life happened, and that they can't take them. So this paper, which Chris Duncom wrote um, a couple of years ago now, one of the most interesting papers I've seen, looking at all the complexity, is summarized in a quote a psychologist said to me once about antiretroviral therapy and adherence in general. He said, respect the struggle. It's hard taking treatment every day. And me as a doctor, I know I've never completed a course of antibiotics. When I have been on chronic medication, I've really battled to take it, to remember to take it every day. I've actually been amazed at how difficult it is to take a single tablet every single day to remember it. Not necessarily the process and the side effects, but just sometimes not remembering if I'd taken it or not. And I used to be very um, rude about pull boxes. And now the only way I can remember to take my chronic medication every day is to have a chronic, is to have a pull box in front of me that I faithfully decant my monthly therapy to. So finding these tricks of the trade that will work with your patients, understanding how hard the stuff is, um, is, is really important. And as my friend, the psychologist said, respecting that struggle. And that's why also why you're going to see a lot of people focusing on these magic bullets around the vaccines and the cures and things like that. Um, and a lot of focus on 
on making treatment that much easier or not necessarily at all. So what about the drug issues? Now, nuisance side effects can translate into huge adherence issues. You know, as when you're a clinician, you feel like a bit of a hero saying to people, oh, but I saved your life. What's a little bit of bad dreams or a little bit of dizziness? Now, that's okay, except over weeks and years, that grinds on patients and can affect adherence. And in this day and age where we have so many alternatives, it's really not okay for people to have nuisance side effects. They should have next to no side effects at this stage. We've got so many new drugs to choose from. Even in the poorest countries, we've got opportunities to switch from one country to, from one drug to another, and we should be doing that. One of the warnings I would have about long acting injectables is they may not be the magic bullet. If somebody has to come in for every two months for an injection, you're going to have to have systems to catch them if they don't come in for two months. We really worry about resistance um, with the tail of these antiretrovirals if people forget. And we have evidence from this from the contraceptive world where people have to come in for injections and they get, we have breakthrough pregnancies every three months simply because people forgot to, ca to come in for them for their for injections. So the injectables and implantables are big steps forwards, but there are complexities associated with that in both terms of resistance as well as terms of viremia and transmission, which we need to just be factoring in as these new drugs start landing on us. And we're going to have these drugs um, to use probably in the next um, two to three years. Next, what about systems changes? Well, these I think you all will know because they're the easy ones that when we do patient satisfaction questionnaires, one of the top things is the queues. And it's not necessarily that the queue is long. It's the fact I don't know how long I'm going to be there for. Um, and we've done all sorts of, uh, of tweaks on this, you know, often giving time to patients. The average waiting time is three hours. And patients then stop complaining because they know in their heads three hours. I know when I walk into the bank and there's a long queue and there's a big sign that says average waiting time is 10 minutes or when I'm at the airport, my, my um, stress levels go way down because I know what to expect. And I think for many of our patients, just starting to think about creative ways of doing that um, is, is, is a good way to go forward. In my country, people often lose their files. They come, so there's a lot of lack of, of, um, of trust in the healthcare system because we haven't actually taken care of their patient health data. And again, this becomes adherence issues. Why, if you can't be bothered to look after my blood results and my clinical data, how can I trust you to be giving me any accurate information about adherence? Multi-month dispensing is again, something that can be a double-edged sword. Sometimes you can give six months and people can forget they need to come back. But having to come back every month, which is certainly a feature in my country, can also mean that people can't go to their jobs. They have, you know, it's, it's expensive to get to the clinic. Trying to get them the maximum amount of drug, but maintain the adherence can be a bit of a juggling act for the good clinician. As I mentioned, staff attitudes are absolutely critical to this. And I think we never pay enough attention to this. Trying to make to look at the reasons why staff have bad attitudes or why they, oh, there's, there's problems with empathy is really important. And certainly in my situation, it's often because nurses in particular have a very difficult home life um, for all sorts of complex reasons related to my country. Um, and they, they bring their home life to, to, to work, which can make life very, very unpleasant for patients. So my final comments are simple approaches to improve adherence in clinical practice for for you to maybe take home, think about, apply to your clinical situation. I think most people will understand this who are clinicians, nurses, doctors, pharmacists working in the field. Um, but I found that just explaining the treatment regimen, explaining why adherence is so important, just showing people a picture of the cell and where the drugs work is incredibly powerful in terms of maintaining adherence. Um, we've seen this in the HIV world versus the world of diabetes and hypertension where people are much, much more adherent in the HIV clinics than they are in the diabetic and hypertensive and the asthma clinics, simply because I think we've taken far more um, time to actually like explain the drugs to the patients. Try and simplify the regimens. I, particularly, our first line regimens are generally one tablet once a day and very well tolerated, but a lot of the second line regimens are very toxic. And with the introduction of integrase inhibitors, we've got guidelines now that allow us to start moving back to some of the drugs we're using first line safely and away from the protease inhibitors, which have been a staple, a very toxic and expensive staple of second line for a very long time. Don't minimize the side effects. You know, in fact, I often find it's good to say to the patients to give them the worst case scenario. And so some people get very, very dizzy. Some people you know, um, have a lot of sleeplessness with this tablet, but also say to them, some people have nothing at all and give them the permission to have the side effect, but reassure them that in most cases, if you get the side effect, this is going to pass with time. 
obviously promote the routine with pill boxes. I often talk to people about brushing their teeth and, and swallowing the tablet at the same time, which is what I do for myself. Just tell people that get the routine going. And once the routine is going, it's going to take so much less effort for you to, to actually take the tablet. Promote social support. And something we don't do enough is just say, get yourself some treatment. Like your families are often far more accepting. Now, HIV is highly stigmatized still in many communities. But once the social support mechanisms kick in, I've, my experience with my patient population is that when mom and dad or the sister often, um, interestingly enough, it's often the sister, um, start providing support in the background, people start taking their tablets. Probe gently for substance abuse. It can be different in different communities. As I said, alcohol use in my community is one of the biggest things. And then finally, address the treatment and depression and anxiety as best you can. Um, and th these constellation of things, you have to tailor to each group of patients. So my th I think all of you probably know this stuff. It's just sometimes to be conscious of it and to apply it to those groups of patients that you think are going to be an inherent issue. And this is my team that I learned from all the time and where, you know, I continue to learn. And as I said, the adherence patients and the adherence messaging for me is possibly the hardest thing I do as a clinician in my everyday practice. Thank you very much.